we have worked out is a guideline framework of how to safely uh, open America again. And there are several checkpoints in that with a gateway first of showing, depending on the dynamics of an outbreak in a particular region, state, city, or area, that would really determine the speed and the pace with which one does re-enter or reopen. So my, my word has been, and I've been very consistent in this, that I get concerned if you have a situation where the dynamics of an outbreak in an area are such that you are not seeing that gradual over 14 day decrease that would allow you to go to phase one. And then if you pass the checkpoints of phase one, go to phase two and phase three. What I've expressed then and again is my concern that if some areas, cities, states, or what have you, jump over those various checkpoints and prematurely open up without having the capability of being able to respond effectively and efficiently, my concern is that we will start to see little spikes that might turn into outbreaks. States, even if they're doing it at an appropriate pace, which many of them are and will, namely a pace that's commensurate with the dynamics of the outbreak, that they have in place already the capability that when there will be cases, there is no doubt, even under the best of circumstances, when you pull back on mitigation, you will see some cases appear. It's the ability and the capability of responding to those cases with good identification, isolation, and contact tracing will determine whether you can continue to go forward as you try to reopen America. So it's not only doing it at the appropriate time with the appropriate constraints, but having in place the capability of responding when the inevitable return of infections occur. Do we have the coronavirus contained? Uh, Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, right now, it, it depends on what you mean by containment. If you think that we have it completely under control, we don't. I mean, if you look at the, the dynamics of the outbreak, and we are seeing a diminution of hospitalizations and infections in some places, such as in New York City, which has plateaued and starting to come down, New Orleans, but in other parts of the country, we are seeing spikes. So when you look at the dynamics of new cases, even though some are coming down, the, the, the curve looks flat with some slight coming down. So I think we're going in the right direction, but the right direction does not mean we have by any means total control of this outbreak. When you talk about, will this virus just disappear? And as I've said publicly many times, that is just not gonna happen because it's such a highly transmissible virus. And even if we get better control over the months, it is likely that there will be virus somewhere in this, on this planet that will eventually get back to us. So my, my approach towards the possibility of a rebound and a second wave in the fall is that A, it's entirely conceivable and possible that it would happen. But B, I would hope that between now and then, given the capability of doing the testing that you've heard from <clears throat> Admiral Jawa and the ability of us to stock up on personal protective equipment and the workforce that the CDC under Dr. Redfield will be putting forth to be able to identify, isolate, and contact trace, I hope that if we do have the threat of a second wave, we will be able to deal with it very effectively to prevent it from becoming an outbreak, not only worse than now, but much, much less. We're really not talking about necessarily treating a student who gets ill, but how the student will feel safe in going back to school. If this were a situation where we had a vaccine, that would really be the end of that issue in a positive way. But as I mentioned in my opening remarks, even at the top speed we're going, we don't see a vaccine playing in the ability of individuals to get back to school this term. We don't know everything about this virus, and we really better be very careful, particularly when it comes to children, because the more and more we learn, we're seeing things about what this virus can do that we didn't see from the studies in China or in Europe. For example, right now, children presenting with COVID-19 COVID who actually have a very strange inflammatory syndrome, very similar to Kawasaki's syndrome. I think we better be careful if we are not cavalier in thinking that children are completely immune 
the, the deleterious effects. So again, you're right in the numbers that children in general do much, much better than adults and the elderly and particularly those with underlying conditions. But I am very careful and hopefully humble in knowing that I don't know everything about this disease. And that's why I'm very reserved in making broad predictions. There's no guarantee that the vaccine is actually gonna be effective. As you well know, because we've discussed this many times in the past, that you can have everything you think that's in place and you don't induce the kind of immune response that turns out to be protective and durably protective. So one, the big unknown is it will be effective. Given the way the body responds to viruses of this type, I'm cautiously optimistic that we will, with one of the candidates, get an efficacy signal. The other thing that's an unknown, that's of concern, but we'll be able to get around that by doing the tests properly, is that do you get an enhancement effect? Namely, there have been a number of vaccines, two in particular, dengue and respiratory syncytial virus. When the vaccine induces a suboptimal response and when a person gets exposed, they actually have an enhanced pathogenesis of the disease, which is always worrisome. So we wanna make sure that that doesn't happen. Those are the two major unknowns. Putting all those things together, Senator Burr, I still feel cautiously optimistic that we will have a candidate that will give some degree of efficacy, hopefully a percentage enough that will induce the kind of herd immunity that would give a protection to the population at home. Given what we know about the recovery from viruses such as coronaviruses in general, or even any infectious disease with very few exceptions, that when you have antibody present, it very likely indicates a degree of protection. I think it's in the semantics of how this is expressed when you say, has it been formally proven by long-term natural history studies, which is the only way that you can prove, one, is it protective, which I said and would repeat, is likely that it is, but also, what is the degree or titer of antibody that gives you that critical level of protection, and what is the durability? As I've often said, and I again repeat, you can make a reasonable assumption that it would be protective, but natural history studies over a period of months to years will then tell you definitively if that's the case.